And it's why I think, you know, Bitcoin, we, Bitcoiners, like those of us spearheading this, really need to be pushing this at the grassroots level and, and spending a little bit less time worrying about what the CEOs and the investment bankers are doing. Um, <clears throat> because we, we need the individual to be sovereign, right? What we need is to make government less relevant in people's lives. Um, and, and you do that by, you know, taking children out of state funded schools. You do that by um, ma just making the state like less important in your life and less and more about like the people that you're surrounded by rather than spending all of your time and energy worried about what people in Washington, D.C. who you've never met and don't ever interact with are doing. Welcome to the show on a lovely sunny Sunday. <laughs> I've got here heavily armed clown and Neil Woodfine. How are you guys doing? Good to see you. Not back here, man. Nice to be on your show again. Good to have you back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Neil, we, we, we met, huh? I mean, uh, it's been a long time, but um, I, I'm still sometimes, you know, nostalgically remembering the times in Vietnam when Eric Basquale organized the Crypto Economics Conference. That was a good time, you know. Um, there was these the, the old good old days. <laughs> so yeah, guys, absolutely. <laughs> I want to talk to you about um, yeah. I mean, you know, I want to have your perspectives. Uh, what's going on? What the fuck is going on? You know, <laughs> um, and maybe we I can we can just kick it off. Um, you know, it's it's when I think about it, when we observe this, you know, with my girlfriend and we talk about it, it's it seems so serial and dystopian. And I'm not sure whether this tipping point of, I don't know what you call it, dystopian, uh, tyrannical, fascism, uh, uh, you know, system it has, has, you know, kicked into such high gear that... I'm not sure, you know, where to start. I mean, uh, let's. Th this is why I wanted to take, for example, Australia. I just talked, you know, recently with Hess McCook. He gave me sort of an overview, but uh, you might be, you know, you might be probably have been more even update than than me. Uh, and the, the reason I'm, you know, I'm taking Australia as an example is um, because it's really bad. I <laughs> mean. Uh, this is the worst nightmare. And uh, if we, I mean, we can also talk about Germany, you know, where in one state of Germany in Hessen, uh, people can go to the supermarket, buy groceries if they're not, you know, if they don't have a sort of COVID pass or vaccination pass. Uh, in Canada, I think it's something with the flights. You can't fly if you don't have a, so I want to know, like tie this into this whole plant, great reset, monetary reset, uh, of Klaus Schwab and and you know his companions, what is my my specific question is at what Australia is concerned is Australia could it be theoretically monetary wise or you know from this debt bubble and um, could it be so bad in Australia that that's the reason they're pushing it you know with stormtroopers and you can't you know uh, you can't go over five miles and if you do you know you could you you have to you know report back to the police and all this bullshit I mean going on it's 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 a nightmare I mean not to mention the whole you know scientific fraud and uh, manipulation of data and uh I mean, this is not about health. What, what is this about? Um, I mean, I don't think Australia is that special of a case. Um, I mean, obviously, they've taken it further than anybody else has. But um, certainly in the worst of the lockdowns in the UK, there's a lot of very similar tactics being used, like limiting how far people can travel from their homes, um, obviously mask mandates, and expecting people to stay at home rather than stepping outside. So like... Um, I mean, we had it for a while. I think it was a month or two. Um, Australia just seems to have done it for longer and um, taken it just that little bit further. Um, but yeah, I don't like, I don't really see Australia as like, I mean, it is the, the most extreme, but like, it's not that far removed from a lot of the other things that we've been experiencing in other countries so far. Um, as to why Australia is like that, <sighs> At this point, I'm starting to feel like it's just as far as governments decide to take it. Um, like one of the learnings from it is that like people will just swallow anything, doesn't matter where they're from. Like it feels like this has just been waiting to happen for a long time. And maybe the authorities are just coming to realize that. So 
Um, to some extent, I think we're just in the in in the hands of what the authorities decide to do with the the population. Bit of a pessimistic take. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No, very sobering. That's why I love your perspective. It's always you know, sort of outside the eco chamber, um, mate. Uh, heavily armed clown. What, what's what's your take on that? Uh, uh, coming to you live from the center of the uh, echo chamber. Um, <laughs> I actually think <clears throat> that this is democracy fun functioning as intended. Um, I don't have an accurate sampling of what the majority of people in Australia actually believe in their hearts and minds. But I am a pretty staunch believer that none of this would be happening without the consent of the governed. Um, and I think that what you're witnessing is, you know, a, a lot of delusion and a lot of confusion and a lot of psychosis. Um, but it's democratic governance happening on a global scale. And when you've lived under the global monetary paradigm that we have lived under for the last 50 years, that basically is essentially a form of soft central planning, right? Because um, the the cantillionaires pick the economic winners and losers, right? And it's irrespective of the value and productivity that they add to society. Uh, it's not necessarily about satisfying market demand. So when you have this top-down control of capital markets, everything else is downstream of, of economic activity. And um, Hayek actually wrote about this concept in... Uh, the road to serfdom, because he was trying to do intellectual battle with these ideological socialists and central planners who basically said, well, like, yeah, like we hear you, but if we just do this right, um, we could maybe make the world a much, much better place. And he sort of talked about the um, second order effects of central planning and some of the things that you have to give up. It, he was willing to entertain that, like, maybe even let's let's assume maybe it is possible, right? Maybe you could centrally plan better than um, billions of people acting autonomously and individually around the globe and letting, you know, what's good float to the top. Um, rather than, let, let, let's just say for the sake of argument, maybe you could centrally plan a global economy efficiently and not have it blow up in your face. In order to do that, you have to... Uh, erode the the tenets of liberty for the individual at a certain point you can't be free to choose what you do and where you go and how you live and how you behave and how you spend your money um because as the typical uh economic machine starts to break down under central planning all those things have to be taken away from you in order for them to try to rein back in some of this control like you can't just have a little bit of central planning eventually it descends into totalitarianism where you're not free to choose, you know, where you live or what you eat or what you do. Um, and, and that's why it's a core tenant of liberty is private property, right? And this is why Hayek said in The Road to Serfdom that the independence of mind and the strength of character is rarely found in people who are not confident that they can make their own way in the world. And in the last 50 years, you've watched governments um, covertly steal the time and the energy and the wealth of people uh, continuously throughout their entire lifetimes. And there have been a uniquely small group of benefactors of that system. And most everyone else is poorer in net. Yeah, maybe their lives are a little bit easier because of technology or things like that. But this is why you're seeing this mass psychosis is because people don't even have the means, even if they recognize it. In a lot of cases, they don't have the means to go to their employer and say, I don't want to get this vaccine. I don't want to wear the mask. I don't want to quarantine for two weeks. And if you're going to make me, I'm going to quit. Well, they don't have the means to do that because they have families to feed and they live paycheck to paycheck. I think it it speaks full well to how it all comes full circle to like the the points that Hayek was making about the erosion of liberty, you know, goes alongside these things. And um, one more thing, and then I'll be quiet, but uh, Solzhenitsyn talked about in the Ar Gulag Archipelago that um, these things, the, this, they didn't just wake up one morning and they were suddenly in this police state where you could be stolen away from your home in the middle of the night. It was a slow progression. And it was all of these little things that people in their head knew were lies and knew were crazy, uh, but they swallowed them and they were quiet about them, hoping that things would just sort of go back to normal one day. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And it was just a little bit at a time until the next thing you know, he was in the prison. 
So that's called democracy, right? <laughs> I mean, the, now peculiar about Australia is that now, I don't know, maybe you know better about uh, this this whole, uh, was there a gun for confiscation? Because people don't have guns, right? I mean, or did they just voluntarily give up their guns? Because when it really comes like, uh, you know, um, worst case scenario, I mean, they you, people need to defend themselves, like, you know, you, because you have a totally illegitimate government, uh, a totally totalitarian, tyrannical government, what do you do? I mean, if you don't have any guns, uh, you know, versus United States, where I think people are over, even overarmed. <laughs> so... Uh, Um, I don't think Australia's gun ban is, is unique. I mean, everywhere, well, most places in the world have, have banned their guns. So um, I guess you could say the window is open anywhere. And that goes back to my previous point. Like, I don't think, for instance, the UK did anything special or the UK population did anything special that prevented what is happening in Australia right now. There wasn't any kind of like major kind of, um, I mean, we've been having a lot of protests and stuff, but they really haven't changed anything. Um, there hasn't been any kind of major moves by the population to stop what happens. And certainly in my own life, speaking to people like friends, family and neighbours, generally people are either apathetic towards the the, the, the the rules and the measures that are being taken or um, in support of um, and would like more kind of extreme stuff than whatever we've got. It has to be done even more extreme. Um, and so like, again, going to that gun thing, I don't think the lack of guns has caused what happened in Australia because everybody else has the lack of guns and, it's, and they're also possibly supportive of these measures. And they just haven't been implemented. So it just seems to be up to the people at the top, like how sensible are they to like, and everybody else will just go with it. Um, and I think like all of us have to start making preparations with that kind of um, environment, environment in mind. Like we have to understand that like, okay, this could go much further and most of the people around us are going to support it. Like, okay, what what can I do to make sure that like I get through a situation like that and um, and maybe even thrive um, in a situation like that? So, um, okay, let me, okay, let me, let me, let me put it a different way. Maybe my question, um, is it, you know, because we are all Bitcoiners, uh, I would say, you know, or Bitcoin maximal is what we call us. Um, and we, you know, we see Bitcoin as the ultimate root solution for everything. It it would, in long term, you know, at least would defund this whole fiat system, the whole governmental structures, the totalitarian structures. Uh, are we on a, um, in a time race? Like, like, is there, would, would you say that, um, or do you see Bitcoin evolving so fast with this whole totalitarian, um, you know, um, unfolding um, that it could eventually sooner or later, hopefully sooner, uh, defund this whole structure and we can finally, you know, create, a, create structures where people can, uh, you know, go back to the roots and <laughs> live in freedom again. You know what I'm saying? Um, could you clarify the question a bit more? Yeah, you know, when we talk about Bitcoin, you know, fixes everything, Bitcoin fixes the world. Um, when when we see all these things unfolding, like this, all the totalitarian measures and oppressive, you know, regimes and, 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 and uh, this, uh, you know, vaccine um, um, uh, pass um, enforcement and everything else and people actually being forced to... to uh, being vaccinated or, you know, being, or they're just threatened or intimidated, you know, losing their jobs and everything. Um, hypothetically, if people, if let's say we, we make it until whatever, like until 20, uh, the year 2022, 23, and there's a substantial number of people adopting Bitcoin, using Bitcoin, would that somehow, uh, you know, gradually and suddenly uh, defund this whole system and and we can go back to sanity? Like, is that clear? Yeah, yeah, no, I, got, I got you. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, certainly, I think um, one of Bitcoin's best defenses against um, potential moves against Bitcoin or um, just the population in general is just to monetize as fast as possible. Um, there are all sorts of kind of 
threats to Bitcoin and Bitcoiners, um, which like if monetization happens slowly enough, could start to rear the rugby head and kind of um, it could become a risk to hold Bitcoin or talk about Bitcoin at some point. And um, in a similar way, that it's becoming very risky to talk about vaccines. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I think like a fast monetization is uh, poss- a possibly ideal scenario. Um, that said, like if you monetize too fast, um, you're going to end up with a massive bull run. Um, everybody's going to be speculating and like there will be an overshot, right? And like there's a, it could be a lot, like most of the people that get on board with Bitcoin, um, the majority of people will get on right at the end, um, but they have to. And um, a lot of those people will get burned. Um, and like it's an inevitability, I think. There's not really any way of kind of getting around that. And that could cause them to get like a, a negative reaction towards Bitcoin and um, like ask for government um, support and, and um, um, various different government measures. So like, I guess there's a, there's a potential risk of something like that happening if Bitcoin monetizes too fast. Um, that said, like I can't see the, the last stages of Bitcoin, hyper-Bitcoinization happening slowly. Um, it seems like it's always going to happen fairly rapidly. So maybe like that kind of outcome is inevitable and hopefully like the government will be defunded enough by that point for it not to be too concerning when everybody's calling for some kind of like um, countermeasures. Okay. What, uh, what, what kind of factors do you see right now that is, ex- you know, speeding up, accelerating this whole process? Is it like, you know, I mean, with, we, we've heard about these ETFs. Uh, to be honest, I'm not paying much attention to that. Or is that, you know, El Salvador and maybe other smaller or mid-sized countries, whether it be Latin America or Middle East or, you know, adopting Bitcoin as legal tender or um, Bitcoin mining is now so distributed. I mean, the hash rate in the United States, what is it, like 50% now or something? And like, are these like factors, heavy arm cloud, like uh, that could, that are, that is contribute, that is, you know, everything's contributing to this whole process? Do you see I, that? Yeah, I think a lot of what you're seeing, well, if, if you're looking at like a global geopolitical level, I think something like El Salvador, kind of, you could probably consider grassroots in a way. Uh, it's it's being built from the bottom up, but a lot of attention to Bitcoin and a lot of number go up, I think is coming from um, just this nonsense that is the global macro environment. Um, you know, I don't know that there's ever been a point in time in history when the governments of the world, like the entire world, has been as leveraged as it is right now. I, I would find it incredibly unlikely uh, that that would be the case at any other point in time in history because we are at the tail end of this global fiat money experiment, and that has never happened before. Um, I think, you know, look to the liquidation event of March of 2020. Uh, and just remember how quickly things just went south. Like it was like it, it was like a flash in the pan, right? I mean, suddenly everyone's paper gains just evaporated, and it happened in Bitcoin too, right? And and then we saw things slowly start to recover. It took a few months, and we sort of built back up to where we were. But they had to do a lot behind the scenes um, to keep that entire thing from just simply collapsing out from under itself. And I think. If you look to history, like if you look at the collapse of the Roman Empire and you look at how they debased their currency as their society started to fall, you know, throughout its its time. Um, and then at the tail end of the Roman Empire, their the silver content in the denarius had basically been completely removed I and mean, it was practically gone. Um the Romans, they couldn't even pay their soldiers anymore. The soldiers didn't want the currency. And that was a big part of why their empire collapsed, right? Because they were imperialist and they needed to project that military power to maintain their standing as the hegemonic order. And soldiers were saying, well, I don't want your coins, pay me in uh, salt, right? We're coming to that point. We're not there yet, but all it takes is one liquidation event like we had back in March um, that they that they can't paper over as effectively as they have done. And I'm not wishing for that. I'm not hoping for that. But I'm saying that that is 
a very likely reality um, just because the amount of leverage in the system has made it incredibly volatile and unstable. Um, and, and when that point happens, um, people are going to be forced to make a decision because they're going to be forced with reality, right? For the first time, a lot of people are going to be forced with reality and they're going to say, well, you, I don't want to accept your dollars. Like I'm a soldier, I'm a sailor, or I'm a, even like I'm a government bureaucrat and I push pencils, um, whatever it is. I don't want to accept your government paper because I can't use it to buy bread to feed my family. Um, that, that's a very real economic reality. That's a very tangible economic reality. And these governments of the world are so broke because they're so over leveraged and they don't produce anything. They don't, short of confiscation by force, which at that point, um, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to evaluate that kind of as it comes because these things are emergent, but um they don't have an alternative means uh, unless like, as I agree with Neil, like Neil said that the monetization kind of has to happen quickly or like it's better if it happens quickly, because what we don't want is for this to happen slowly over decades for them to have enough time to get an alternative system sort of locked and loaded and ready to go. And then they say, okay, well, we're just moving you over to um, central bank digital currencies, by the way, make sure you get the chip put in your arm um, at the local clinic so that you can um, buy groceries. How fast are central bank digital currencies? Like, do you think they can, uh, how, how, how fast do you think they, they could roll this out? Um, you, you know, in, even here in European Union or, or in the States, do you think this is like a concrete plan or is this like so far off, we don't even have to worry about it? Because this is something really concerning. I mean, this means like, as, as, as Carson, what's his name? This fat guy of Bank of International Settlements, in his own words, is about absolute control, right? So is this about absolute control, right? I mean, uh... I think it's more about throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. I'm sure that somewhere there's government agencies that are tasked with working on this problem. Um, but I don't believe that it's all that well thought out or that it will be necessarily all that well implemented or that it will arrive quickly. Um, just based on my experience with how a lot of these types of government programs go, they're often extremely bloated, um, very expensive, lack focus. Um, I, I, I think that they're a threat, like they're definitely something to watch. But I think that just the fact that they exist sort of almost adds legitimacy to the case for Bitcoin. Um, and and they're, I think that they're going to be so slow to the punch and so ineffective um, that it's very possible that they may be doing us a favor just by even broaching the, top, broaching the topic and, and trying to meme it into the public consciousness, the idea of a CDBC. And just some context uh, from China, they, they already do have their CDBC. A friend sent me a screenshot, I think it was on a bank screen, um, some uh, online banking thing, and there was an option for some CDBC deposits. But it's super unintuitive and like not obvious how it's useful or how to use it. Um, I'm sure some people have worked out what it's for, but um, it's there. Um, but I think like going back to what... Um, uh, heavily armed as thing. Um, I think our best defense against CDBCs are um, government incompetence when it comes to techno technology projects. Basically every government technology project, whether it's an NHS, NHS database or um, like I was there when China implemented the um, online ticketing system for the train system. So they, they just deployed a, a national um, so you could book things online. Um, and that was a disaster. Like it took months and months, years before it was um, like properly functional. So that will definitely slow down any CDBC attempts. But I think like they kind of have to um, implement CDBC. So it will happen. Like if they want to do negative interest rate policies, they need to eliminate cash. They're going to need CDBCs to do that. Um, if they want to do like helicopter money and like dropping like UBI on people. Um, Ideally, you're going to have like um, every citizen is going to have their own CDBC account, and it's a lot harder to do that through like the commercial banking system where nobody's sure how many accounts people have when it could get lost and stuff. So, um, I feel like it's kind of inevitable. It's just like 
is Bitcoin going to monetize faster than they could? I mean, it could take them 10, 20 years, 30 years to get a CBDC, right? Um, so uh, that, that said, like there's also the threat of like big tech is increasingly working very closely with um, governments. So if like, let's just look at China, for example, like Alipay or, so let's say a CBDC experiment was a complete disaster and it didn't work. Like the contractors, they, they hired like, this terrible system that doesn't even work. Um, it could just be like, okay, Alibi, can you like deploy a CDBC implementation for us? Or WeChat, can you or can you both do it together? And they're obviously a lot more competent when it comes to um, building technology projects and would be like very happy to get a, a huge government contract like that. And like over here, you could probably have like Google and Apple and, and those guys um, helping deploy a CDBC. Maybe I'm like, this is, I mean, it's pure speculation, right? but um, uh, yeah. I think it's definitely something to be concerned about. Like, um, like it seems inevitable that they, they, they have to try. Otherwise, like, they just kind of do their, their negative interest rate policies. You you lived like how many how many years did you live in in China, right, uh, Neil? I lived in I lived in China for eleven, and then Thailand for three. Wow. Uh, okay. It's amazing. I admire you guys. I mean, like, you know, Peter Young, as I, we, we talked before, you know, he was staying here at our place. It was, we had such a good time. So it's amazing. He talks Mandarin. And this is, so um, how bad, like, how bad is this? I mean, the surveillance, the social credit system, the tra trackability, is this really like so dystopian or is it like not really so matured yet? Or I think you hinted at it, like... Um, I left in 2018 and certainly like, I think that it was called Sesame Credit back then, like it didn't affect my life, didn't affect anybody I knew, it didn't affect their lives at all. Um, I know that people like that racked up massive credit card debts weren't allowed to fly, they were taking like taken on a no fly list, but I don't know if that was related or not. Um, but uh, it never really kind of affected uh, me. It was, I mean, like the, the main problem at the time was just like uncertain regulations kind of all of a sudden like closing down various aspects of our industry and then all of a sudden closing down like um, the restaurant and bar industry. Like it was just like this constantly shifting ground. Um, but in terms of surveillance stuff, didn't, didn't really know. So, and to be honest, like, I don't know, I, I stay pretty like, I keep a closer eye on the, the, the British surveillance situation. It's pretty bad over here. Like everything is monitored. Like all your ISP keeps all of your records for um, like, I can't remember how long it is. It's a year, two years. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's various different things going on here. It's, um, it's getting quite scary. And there's lots of CCTV here as well, of course. I think you could say the same thing about the US too. I mean, the, the surveillance state is very pervasive and omnipotent. Um, <clears throat> and, and all of that is downstream, like at least in the United States. I can't speak as well to it in Europe, but in the United States, it's all kind of downstream of the war on terror, right? Where uh, America's Americans used to have a lot of precedents in place to protect them from that type of eavesdropping by the government, um, and that was all given up in the in the attempt to claw back safety, right? Um, I, th I think we're all familiar with that that Benjamin Franklin phrase that anyone who would give up liberty to seek safety deserves neither liberty nor safety. Um, but we've, we've watched, I mean, I've certainly watched that in my lifetime. Um, I was pretty young when, when 9-11 happened in the United States. So it was a pretty formative event for me. And I've, I've watched it, the ways that it's changed the world that I grew up in. Um, and the, the, the ways that it moves the Overton window uh, in terms of what's acceptable for the government to do um, for your sake, right? And I think too, I, I'm sure I, I've been to China. I've never lived in China, but I think there's a lot of, um, it's easy to like watch a video and see people walking around in the mall and see like the surveillance cameras scanning their faces and to think like, wow, that's scary. But China is a huge, well, it, land mass, it's a, it's a large country, but it's also, it's an extremely populous country. And a lot of people live in fairly rural locations. And I think if you were to really get down to brass tacks and see what those people's lives are like, any type of surveillance in their life, maybe is still done on like pen and paper. I mean, it, it'd be the same thing in America too, right? Cause there's a lot of really rural places where people can live um, where like, yeah, that, that surveillance system exists, but if you're not in the center of it, it it's not like um, big brother always can watch you, but 
he may not always be watching you. Uh, I, I think is kind of the takeaway there. Yeah. Um, do you see a, do you see this phase right now where, you know, let's just take, you know, as a concrete example, uh, El Salvador, uh, cause there was this, you know, headline where allegedly people are more, you know, depositing more dollars and, you know, instead of withdrawing dollars, they're depositing. So is that a sign that more and more, not only El Salvador, but in other countries where this phase is beginning, where people are recognizing Bitcoin as a savings technology for the first time they see, why should I, you know, put my money, you know, in, in, into any kind, you know, fiat currency or anything, anything else, uh, uh, instead of, you know, putting it into the best savings technology there is, and that is Bitcoin. Do you, do you, is that like a hopeful, one of the hopeful signs you see? Um, I, 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 I've still got some bad feelings about El Salvador. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to work out. Um, like, is there a big kind of um, Bitcoin is savings propaganda campaign there? Like, I'm, I'm not sure. I definitely haven't seen anything myself, although I haven't been paying too close attention to the situation there. But I, I feel like to some extent, with Bitcoin, ideally, you want people coming to Bitcoin naturally because they've observed things happening in the economy or like observed after getting into Bitcoin. Um, if you've kind of like pushed everybody into getting into Bitcoin, I feel like they, they're more likely to make um, mistakes such as like speculating and selling at the bottom, buying at the top, um, things like that. And as well, like people in El Salvador probably have like in general, they have less room to make mistakes with their financial decisions. So um, yeah, a little bit risky. Also, like I, I just, I don't know how much true adoption is going on there. Like I've seen a lot of people over the last few years making attempts to get um, uh, retail adoption of Bitcoin and like they'll help them set up their like um, um, scanning devices and um, like whether it's Lightning or Bitcoin on-chain payments. And it just generally never gets used very much. So, like, yeah, I mean, I know there's the beach in El Salvador, but I think that's quite a small place. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not totally convinced that there's a whole lot of Bitcoin activity going on there. Um, again, that's a massive pessimistic take, but, like, if, if it does turn out to be a successful project and they offer um, refuge to Bitcoiners in a great reset, like, I'll be, I'll be over there in a flash. Um, yeah, I, okay, I'm no, just no, uh, your take keep, is keeping an eye on the situation. So Neil, are you saying that um, this was like the, the the whole process of you know it it was wrong like to push people like do, do you see that as a sort of a coercion like you know I mean they don't have to use Bitcoin right I mean they can still go back and forth or or like how bad do you think it, this process is is like is it like more dictatorial this whole process or would you have it done it differently I mean I mean yeah and organically naturally as you as you implied. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting experiment. So, like, um, I, I couldn't say that it was definitely a mistake to do it the way that they did it. Maybe it's good to just, like, rip the Band-Aid off and, like, get everybody in um, as quickly as possible. But I just think, like, some kind of government promotion and enforcing... Um, I don't know how much retailers were actually forced to accept Bitcoin payments, but let's assume that they were forced to do that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's, like... Uh, um, the right kind of natural way to get people into Bitcoin. Um, I mean, just having observed uh, uh, people around me, like if people are like, really, like definitely like buy some Bitcoin and like you push them really hard and then they buy it and like often they make a bunch of mistakes. It's, it's generally better that they like get Bitcoin first and then start getting into it. Um, yeah, as well, like, I mean, uh, El Salvador in terms of like the, 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 the broader kind of, Bitcoin adoption thing, like not many people care about like small country like that. And I, I know it's like harsh to say it. Um, it certainly helps the Bitcoin branding. Like, okay, like one co country has adopted it as their, um, uh, um, I haven't adopted it as a reserve asset yet, I don't think, but they've adopted Bitcoin. Um, that helps the branding, but at the same time, like most people like in the UK or whether they like institutions buying Bitcoin or whatever, like it's not like a huge deal. To them so like i think bigger factors in bitcoin adoption at the moment are people noticing inflation like very very normal people around me are definitely waking up to the fact that inflation is um, a threat to their livelihoods 
um, and that Bitcoin is like an alternative. And they're like happy to talk about Bitcoin in that context. And that wasn't happening a year ago, two years ago. Like that's a new, a new development. Um, and then just the number going up, like Bitcoin has limited supply. More and more people are kind of like waking up to Bitcoin and that just forces the price just like inevitably. And when the Bitcoin price goes up, people start getting interested in it. They see the charts and like, okay, I can make some money on this and you know, yeah. start thinking yeah. about like, okay, why is that value? Eventually, I'm hoping, you know, we're going to, you know, not to think in fiat denominated terms, but in purchasing power. But that that's going to be a totally different ball game. I think that means uh, the process of hyper Bitcoinization. Now, heavily armed cloud, what I want to know from you is like, what would you see in El Salvador than the net benefit? Isn't that like the remittance, uh, you know, replacement of rem all these re remittance services like Western Union, whatever? And, you know, with all the risks and the fees and, you know, and uh, the, the whole headache that is involved with, with remittances, is that like a net benefit, do you think? Um, yeah, I, I think, well, so let me let me comment on the, the previous stuff and then I'll come back to that because I think it kind of builds up to it. Um, I think it's kind of up to us to shift the narrative a little bit around Bitcoin to Bitcoin as a savings technology. Um, I think that we're still stuck in a very financialized way of thinking about Bitcoin. And you see this in the types of terminology that people use, but like instead of saying that they're saving in Bitcoin, they say that they're dollar cost averaging. Uh, even, and I, I had a thread about this on Twitter yesterday because it's one of my pet peeves, but they're not dollar cost averaging. They're just cash poor investing. Uh, they're lump sum purchasing every time. Yeah, I read hey, that. Mo yeah. Most people anyway. <laughs> Um, and it's just like that, that's semantics, like whatever. But but the the larger point of that thread is that like I want to see a narrative shift around this where you're you're not dollar cost averaging. Like that's what you do when you're investing in your 401k or whatever. You're saving in Bitcoin, you're saving some of the fruits of your labor in this harder store of value. And I think um I'm gonna get a little cosmic on you here, but I I think. In the grand scheme of things, we've maybe lost a little bit of our touch because guys like Michael Saylor come along, who's extremely intelligent, extremely successful, uh, and the types of people we want on our side, right? Um, but Michael Saylor appeals to a very specific group. Um, a lot of Michael Saylor's rhetoric, rhetoric is targeted at other institutional investors, other large companies and CEOs and corporations. And, uh, you know, I think it's inevitable that a lot of the bigger players in the global geopolitical and, and economic landscape do get involved with this um, just because the game theory is inevitable, like, you know, number go up and these people are going to continually get interested in Bitcoin and say like, okay, well, it's going to take us some time, but we're going to make some moves into this thing, even if it's small amounts. And we like that as Bitcoiners, we like that because number go up, right? We like to see this company is adopting a Bitcoin standard. This company is buying Bitcoin. This nation state is making it a legal tender. This government is putting it on their balance sheet. I like, you know, extrapolate that out. We like to see that because number go up and it makes us feel dopamine and happy and it makes us feel richer. Um, but I don't necessarily think that that type of top-down adoption is what we really need to be working for and striving for because it, like, it, it is going to happen inevitably because Bitcoin is just a superior monetary technology and it will be adopted uh, by the bigger players. But I think what we should really be pushing for and why I think this narrative shift to Bitcoin as a savings technology is important is because we want to be pushing this to the lower rungs of society. Honestly, we, the people who benefit most from Bitcoin, we want Bitcoin to be a grassroots adoption, uh, a grassroots movement that builds itself from the bottom up. I mean, because like I said, eventually, you know, the central banks and the CEOs and the investment funds and whatever, they're going to adopt a Bitcoin um, or they're going to die, right? So what we want to do is maybe realign our focus a little bit on, yeah, because I understand some guy in El Salvador who um, converts all 20 of his dollars into Bitcoin isn't going to really pump the price for us. But if we have a million of him or 10 million of him or a hundred million of him or a billion of him, um, that is substantial, right? That's how you change the world is by getting all of the people um, who, who live their everyday life on board with this and understanding the value of this uh, and the ways in which it can change their life. And I think in the context of the El Salvador thing, um, I, I think it's okay to look at that and 
recognize like, yes, this is a form of coercion, right? It, it, because it is, it's a, di- it's a diktat. It's Bukele saying, I know what's best for you and you will do what I say. Um, and I don't live in El Salvador. I haven't been to El Salvador. I've never been to El Salvador. So I don't know, like Neil said, like to what effect are people actually being forced to use and interact and accept and send and receive Bitcoin? I don't know. Um, I do know that that you can coerce people to do things and sometimes maybe it has positive effects, but, and I think that we are, we can admit that without necessarily advocating for coercion or central planning. I think we can say that like in a vacuum, two decisions made from the top down, one is going to be objectively better than others. Uh, one is going to have better outcomes than others. That doesn't mean we have to advocate for that type of central planning and, and coercion, but I think um, hopefully the, it doesn't turn a lot of people away from Bitcoin as a savings technology. I don't imagine that it will. I, I think that the people of El Salvador are pretty much at the bottom and I don't think there's much else for them to go from there. Um, so even just the remittance savings alone, I think will do a lot to sort of lift those people up by their bootstraps and Bitcoin is there now, right? So it's it's sort of like, okay, well, now we have access to this incredible new technology that very well could change that country a lot in the next 10 years. What if other countries now follows, you know, uh, you know, and, and uh, do the same thing? Like, you know, would it be Argentina, other hyperinflationary countries, you know, like Venezuela, Argentina? I mean, that could, it could happen potentially, right? In the next few months, a year, or a couple of years. Uh, and then we're talking like a different ball game, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess from my perspective, like if you get like, I think it was it Panama also considering it and then Ukraine also made some noises about it. Like um, if you look at El Salvador as just the first of many, um, like the first step, then yeah, um, it's good in that respect. Uh, also, I think like the best argument um, in support of the coercion it are, uh, are the people that are um, against it because there's a lot of people kicking around on Twitter, the wrong kinds of people kicking around on Twitter, complaining very, very loudly about Bitcoin being made legal tender and how awful that is. And they've never, ever made a noise about the US dollar or whatever local currency is, is legal tender um, in their lives. Like, yeah, I find that really like a little bit hypocritical and hard to swallow. Um, I think a lot of people just don't like to see Bitcoin win sometimes. Well, it's funny because we live in a coercive world, right? I mean, if it wasn't that, it'd be something else, right? So it's kind of like we can't deny the reality that we live in, which is that there's a lot of um, top-down control. Uh, and it, it, if if we acknowledge that and we accept that, that is the reality, right? Because that's what we're here trying to fix. Well, if they're going to force them to use something, at least it's Bitcoin, <laughs> Uh, heavily on Clunk, you you mentioned like previously or at the beginning like the, this process could or, or actually Neil, you both of you said that you know it, this whole process could could be a little bit too fast. If it happens too fast, it might have you know negative implications or or some kind of you know uh, not wishful implications. Um, could it be that um, you know? Uh, you know, we have heard now from even politicians and senators and even central bankers, um, let's say rather, you know, supportive, you know, positive statements in regards to, to Bitcoin. Uh, do, do you, I mean, do you think that there are silently governments and even central banks are accumulating, at least accumulating, you know, uh, within, you know, in bigger tranches or smaller tranches, Bitcoin as a reserve asset, uh, but without, you know, publicly disclosing it, is that, is that something you, you are, might be, you know, uh, we, could, we could see this like unfolding? Um, I, um, it would be pure speculation either way. So I, I don't know, I don't have an opinion on that. Um, I do think though that, um, I just read a book recently, The Tower of Basel, so on the um, inner workings of the BIS. And um, a lot of people there 
historically have been quite big fans of gold and they definitely like um, take a lot of gold positions around the world. Um, I could imagine that behind the scenes, they're also um, um, interested in Bitcoin. There's definitely a guy at the BIS, he's tweeted um, safety a few times and he's definitely opened the idea of um, uh, Bitcoin. So whether they're doing it now on, or not, I could see that kind of thing happening. Um, I don't think that's necessarily a, si a good sign for Bitcoin in general or Bitcoiners, because I think they could simultaneously take their own physical Bitcoin positions um, while also deploying all sorts of horrendous um, regulations for um, regular Bitcoin users and do those things at the same time. Um, deploy like various like confiscatory um, tax regimes um, and also like all sorts of surveillance and like mandatory custody and at the same time like just holding a bunch of um, Bitcoin themselves. So um, yes, I can imagine them doing it, but um, not necessarily good for Bitcoin. Also, you don't want those kind of people having Bitcoin anyway. What about the gold? Uh, you know, I mean, we, we, we could say that in general that the, the you know, let's say the, the the more knowledgeable and ethical gold bugs, uh, some of them, you know, even the people you know, from Incrementum, for example, or I think Mark Valek is one of those. And yeah, uh, do you think that by buying and supporting gold, are we are we not directly, indirectly supporting the central banks? I mean, uh, the people, you know, who are buying and holding gold, uh, uh, are those people like in a way supporting the, the, you know, the central bank fiat system? I don't necessarily think so. I think gold is in the process of demonetization. Um, and I really do believe that. I know a lot of people will probably scoff at that, but I really do think we're watching that happen. Um, I think that, oh, you know, like, cause gold isn't used for final settlement anymore, largely. Um, it's, 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 practically irrelevant other than as a as a hedge against inflation which it hasn't done very well in the last decade um it's it's practically irrelevant like in the, in the macroeconomic landscape it's it's just this thing that sits on the wall that some people still think might be a good store of value but it's totally demonetized like it it isn't used really for anything and and some central banks like they don't even have any gold and I don't really think that their monetary hegemony has anything to do with how much gold they have uh, because it's not used for settlement at all. Uh, and, and I say this a lot, but gold failed as a monetary technology. Um, it, it's like <clears throat> it's like betting on the, the telegram, um, you know, with when you have email. I mean, it's <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it's you know, you're, you're, it's not like you're keeping the telegram companies in power by doing that. You're just betting on the losing horse. So I'm definitely a scoffer. Um, I think there is no reality, no possible um, uh, outcome where you have a hyperinflationary environment and gold doesn't perform well. Certainly, it hasn't um, done so well over the last 10 years, 20 years. But um, I think we can possibly attribute that to various manipulations within the markets. Um, it's not possible if physical gold doesn't go crazy when um, uh, uh, fiat starts collapsing. Um, and as well, like if Bitcoin doesn't succeed, because there is no guarantee that like Bitcoin will 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 work out, um, then gold will be the fallback. And that's been, I mean, historically that's been proven out. We like the world will at some point, maybe we go to like an SDR or a CDBC first, but when that collapses, you're going back to gold 100%. So um, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't think gold is a, is a bad bet. Um, I think Bitcoin is better at this point, but um, I, I wouldn't write gold off. Just yet, and then like to the question of whether buying uh, buying gold supports the wrong kinds of people, um, supports um, central banks and stuff. Personally, I think if it's like a matter of survival and like maintaining a um, a diverse portfolio to be able to like um, still thrive in whatever outcome, I, I still think it, gold is a sensible purchase um, from that kind of perspective. I, I definitely respect that position, Neil, and I think that we should look at um, more than just like, because obviously all else being equal, if we have a hyperinflation event, you know, the price of everything goes up because that's that's what it is, right? I mean, it's a failure of the money. 
Um, so I think more broadly speaking, we should remember that what really matters is whether or not gold maintains its monetary premium through an event like that. Not necessarily just whether or not the, the fiat denominated spot value goes up. So what you really need to be doing when you're thinking, when you're trying to calculate like whether or not that's a good economic decision is to say, okay, if this event were to happen, this hyperinflation event, would the value of gold go up relative to Bitcoin, right? Would I be gaining my purchasing power? Would I be able to get more Bitcoin than I did yesterday with that bar of gold? Um, and, and if the, the answer to that question is no, then it's losing its monetary premium. Fiat is a broken measuring stick, right? So like measuring that with fiat isn't really going to do you any good because the dollar buys fewer Satoshis every single day you know, on average uh, than it did the day before. And so I, and I think that that sort of highlights the shift in thinking that we're going to have to have in terms of how we make our economic calculations if, if we're able to wrap our minds around using Bitcoin to do our economic calculations rather than um, the, the melting ice cube that is fiat. How much is the industrial usage of of gold? Like, you know, if, we, if we're looking forward, you know, if we are somehow uh, predicting that it could, you know, eventually be demonetized, uh, gold would could be demonetized. Like, uh, what? What? I mean, if if we if if gold was just just used for industrial, for technological, you know, production or uh, you know, processing, whatever, uh, how much is it right now? Do do you, do you guys know? Like. What's the percentage? Uh, no idea. Um, I'm guessing it's single digits. But then also okay. one thing to bear in mind that monetization negatively affects the industrial uses, right? So because gold demands a monetary premium, people use it less in the industry if it gets demonetized by Bitcoin, which I think is inevitable if Bitcoin works, um, then you'll see way more um, industrial usage. Um, maybe you would see it less in jewelry because it'll have less value, I don't know. Um, I think people would still... Um, still use it, but uh, I'm not sure on that one. It's, it's the same thing with silver too. Um, Cause I remember about a year ago, well, it's actually at this point, it would have been almost 18 months ago. Um, I think it was like last summer, the price of silver pumped pretty considerably, you know, given the last 10 years. And I wrote an article that basically said silver is overvalued. Right. And of course, I take a lot of flack for that from the metal bugs because they're thinking, um, well, what do, what do you mean? What is overvalued? Right. I mean, it's like nothing makes sense anymore. They're printing tons and tons of paper. Silver is scarce. Uh, but my, my broader point is that like silver, gold is one thing. Right. But silver is, is already demonetized. Um, silver has no, no purpose anymore because silver solved the divisibility problem of gold. So, in my mind, essentially, all of that monetary premium of silver that still exists is just hot air. Um, and, and there's a lot of monetary premium in a lot of things that shouldn't be there. That is because of how broken the money is. But in you compare the industrial demand for silver in, in industrial applications to its monetary premium. I mean, you're talking about like less than 10% of, of silver demand comes from uh, industrial use application. And, and like Neil said, like it's actually better for society for that price to come down because then those metals are more um, easily employed in terms of the utility that they provide to the entrepreneur and to the market rather than fun functioning as a pseudo store of value because our money is so bad. There's a relative scarcity in gold, right? So, uh, so in average, what is it like one, two to maximum 3%? Uh, there's a sort of annual inflation or, or extra gold digged up uh, per year. Um, could that like change with the dem 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 demonetization? Like, could it go to zero or could it actually increase if we just use it for, you know, industry or technological hardware? Like, uh, I think it's just a question of how, how expensive gold is. If mm -hmm. gold price goes down, then the amount of gold mined will definitely go down because there's a certain price associated with mining that 2%, and it makes sense at the current gold price. Am I thinking that through? Probably I probably have to think about this more before speaking, actually. Um, I'm pretty sure that should go down, though. I, I think the thing to remember there, though, is that there's a ton of gold 
on the planet that's not being used, right? Because it's being held as a speculative store of value. Um, if gold were to start lose its monetary premium, which, like I said, I, I do think it has, um, or I do think it, it is, it's in that process of happening, that gold, yeah, while, while new production would come down, there's, there's a ton of gold available to be employed. Um, it's just nobody is willing to, in my mind, pay the fair or sell it for the fair value, which is its, its industrial use utility value. Yeah, I'd just like to reaffirm, I'm, def I'm pretty confident on this one. Um, if the price goes down, the, the inflation rate will go down necessarily. And then if the price of gold goes up, then inflation will actually increase Like because there'll be a lot more gold that suddenly is uh, more viable to mine because they can make profit from it. Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree yeah. with that. Yeah, and, and, and with that, you know, I mean, it's all, you know, like digging up more gold or any other metal or scar or, or you know, uh, what do you call it? Those rare earths. Uh, it's a matter of energy, right? And, and technological innovation and how much resources and time you put into it. So if they really wanted to, or if the demand, if there was, re was really high demand, then, you know, they could just innovate, you know, better have better drilling device or whatever, better technology, or even artificially create gold. Even Eric Vaskell, I think, said that once, you know, it's not a big deal, like, you know, <laughs> to, to create what, whatever, you know, technology there is, nuclear or sub-nuclear plasma technology or fusion technology, it, you know, uh, or on a sub-matter level, you could probably create more gold, but then, you know, poof, you know, where's the monetary value of that? Yeah, nobody's worked that one out so far, so I, I, I wouldn't worry about that. Like, if I was going to choose a money and it was either fiat or, or gold, I would still yeah. go with the, the chances yeah. that gold wouldn't, wouldn't hyperinflate. So, guys, um, Heavy League Arm Clown, you, you and Brian Prentice, shout out to him. Uh, you guys created this uh, website, uh, What the Fuck Happened 971. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, what if there wasn't a Nixon shock in 1971? Or when, when was it like, like in specific, was it, was it in 71 or, or was the total unpegging like, or the, the, the impossibility to redeem, uh, you know, into gold like in 73 or something? Like, uh, what, uh, I mean, my question is like, what, what would have happened <laughs> if, it, if there wasn't a Nixon shock? <clears throat> so you mean what would have happened if we were still on the Bretton Woods system? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Or like still peg to go. Like, you know, nothing would have changed. I think that that would be impossible. I, I don't think that that could be the case because um, Bretton Woods was a system that was largely based around granting a certain advantage to the sovereign state in terms of its ability to manipulate the monetary system. Uh, with the greatest advantage being granted to the United States because they were the post-war power. Um, and, and I think it, it couldn't have played out any different than it did. And I say that because the suspension of the redemption of specie or the, the convertibility of currency has a lot of historical precedent. Um, prior to 1971, it was used in 1933. It was used all throughout the 19th century. You know, it was employed in, in Europe by, in, um, in the UK, um, throughout history as well. Like it, it's not, uh, it wasn't an, it's not an unprecedented thing. It's not an uncommon thing. Government uses private financial industries to expand its access to credit. And when those industries get in trouble, uh, it, it steps in and typically works to halt liquidation events, right? That, that happen uh, on the tail end of malinvestment caused by government expansion of credit and money supply. And really, that's all 1971 was, was the government stepping in and doing what it had done many times throughout history in the United States, which was halting that liquidation process, uh, that settlement to the base layer of money, uh, so that it could protect its ability to continue expand money and credit. And I, I don't really see it playing out any other way. Um, because they don't like to allow that liquidation to happen because government's don't like being held accountable to the market forces of their local economy. So uh, it, I, I almost can't even imagine um, what it would look like if it, if it hadn't, because I, I kind of see it as inevitability. 
Right, right. Got it. Um, so, you know, there's this uh, um, Triffin dilemma. Um, maybe one of you or both of you could, could elaborate on that, where, you know, uh, the dollar is the international reserve currency or the dominant, you know, international reserve currency. And, but with that comes a dilemma. Could you could you elaborate on that? Like uh, the, the question, you know, um, I want to like direct this into the um, into this question where, you know, how long could this whole process be procra procrastinated with everything unfolding, even in China, you know, the ever grandest thing, like how intertwined is this whole thing with the dollar and the euro dollar? I think the euro dollar is even a bigger mysterium than the, <laughs> but, um, uh, but I think, uh, who was it, Nick Batia? Uh, talked about the euro dollar and um and he said we don't actually know how much euro dollar there is out there like uh can you tie this together so we that our listeners get a bit you know better comprehension and overview what's going on with this international reserve currency the dollar that's definitely a question for heavily armed well yeah i mean the euro dollar system is is incredibly complex i mean go listen to um uh, I believe is the show's name is Jeff Schneider. Yeah, Jeff Schneider's Euro Dollar University. It's like a twenty hours of podcasting where they're yeah. explaining. The to be honest, let me just interrupt. I try to listen. I try to read this stuff. Yeah, I'm you know very humbly. Um, I, I don't understand. <laughs> just too many technical jargon. Uh, way too advanced for me. So I'm not sure. Maybe Greg Foss would be someone who could like break it more down for, for average folks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, don't expect me to explain the intricacies of it, but uh, at a higher level, all it is, you know, what the, the at the top of this power structure is the nation states, right? Because the nation states, by all means and purposes, need to protect their ability to continue to borrow, right? Because just about every nation state around the world that I'm aware of, at least most of the major ones, um, is, is in debt and deficit spending, like on a regular basis. And they need to be able to continue to expand their access to credit. Uh, and to do that, they need to be able to continue to expand the money supply um, in order to maintain their status quo. And, and none of them want to give that up, right? So I think what you're like, and China is just as guilty of this as the United States, right? China expands its credit. Um, and, and it's why you're watching things sort of unravel in real time is because that expansion of money and credit causes malinvestment. And that malinvestment wants to be liquidated by the market. The market likes to allocate capital to profitable endeavors, right? And <clears throat> um, it can't liquidate because th there is nowhere for it to settle. Like it, it, it's not like it used to be where these banks would issue these bank notes, and if they over leverage themselves, everyone would come withdraw their gold, and that would liquidate. Um, you can't, you can't have these liquidation events anymore like you used to. And there's nowhere for all of this built up pressure to go because there's all and and really the the shadow banks of the euro dollar system are just beneficiaries of these government systems that are there that that their purpose is to facilitate the government expansion of credit the government expansion of spending um but there are a lot of other beneficiaries along the way uh you know we people like mark cuban right who is the topic on twitter right now who's just sort of successful because of his ability to politically put himself um close enough to the money spigot to be a beneficiary of all of the downstream implications of of bad economic policy and what you're watching happen in China is really just downstream of that. Like it's, it's this liquidation that wants to happen, that's trying to happen. And it's just being papered over with more expansion of money and credit by the, by the Euro dollar system and also by China's system as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. It makes more sense now. Yeah. Thanks for explaining this. Yeah. Um, so my my final question before we wrap up here is do you it's a totally off uh, top off topic now do you find it a little bit cons you know if we just pretend even that we have a democracies in let's say you know in in the countries we live in and do you would you say i mean we, we do we have a separation of powers at all i mean between <laughs> um legislative executive and judicial system i mean is there do we have a legitimacy at all of of these govern, you know, governing bodies or structures, 
Um, and you know, what what is the what is the option people have when you know when everything is just um, you know a facade is there? You know, where is the criminal prosecutor, for example? You know, when it really when we have systemic systemic uh, criminalities going on, or systemic theft, or systemic fraud, systemic corruption, uh, is that something that you know occupies your mind sometimes? <laughs> Neil, this was this was quite a change up in topic. Yeah, um, uh, that's a big question to to end the the podcast with. Um, uh, I, like, yes, uh, it's very concerning, particularly with all of the new emergency laws. I mean, we already got a whole batch of those. And the terrorism stuff since 9-11 and now we've got a whole new batch of, terror, uh, of emergency laws for um, the, the pandemic so um, and that's like um, got rid of all sorts of kind of um, uh, uh, previously accepted conventions that prevent like governments and um, legal systems overstepping their, their authority um, so yeah I mean it, it's a it's a massive concern um, I was going to say something there, but I totally forgot. I'll hand it over to um, have the arm to try to remember what I was going to say. Yeah, I'll echo what Neil says. That's a pretty broad topic. Um, I don't think, you know, there was a point in time in my life, like I, I've gone through a lot of shifts in thinking on this. Um, I don't think people should be surprised that the state serves the best interests of the state, right? I think that the state exists as a means unto itself. And I think that there's an awful lot of propaganda, uh, particularly that I've been exposed to in America, like during my lifetime, uh, that makes you think otherwise. That makes you think that the state is the ultimate protector and arbiter of the truth and of liberty and of prosperity. Uh, and it's simply untrue, right? And I think we have, we're stuck in this way of thinking that like, oh, well, why doesn't the state like do this better? Like, why don't they fix this, this injustice that's happening? Like, why isn't the state stepping in and stopping this? Because the state exists as a means unto itself. Um, and I think that the, the framers of, like, I can only really speak to America because it's the only political system that I'm comfortable enough really speaking about. Because to be honest, I don't know much about other places because I haven't lived there um, for the most part. I've, I've lived in a few other countries, but not enough to really get involved in the politics. Um, the framers of the American constitution, like we're, we're pretty good at building a system that was somewhat resilient to this concept of government existing as a means unto itself. But all that did was slow down the inevitable snowballing of, um, that, that phenomenon of, of existing as a means unto itself and, and, um, growing its tentacles out for its own purposes um, and, and serving the interests of the people that managed to worm their way to the top of that power structure. Uh, I, I think that the, these things are inevitabilities. I think that democracy doesn't scale. Um, I think that uh, like nation states have, are just simply too big, right? They, 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 these governance structures, they just don't work at the scale. Democracy could maybe work at like a very small level, like at the city level. And even then you'd run into a lot of problems, right? Because what if you don't want what 51% of your neighbor wants? These are just essentially civil attacks on liberty. Um, and I have trouble looking at it any other way than that these days. Yeah. So um, I'd say like on that, it kind of overrates democracy because these, these days it feels like um, authorities are just making decisions themselves and like, People just go with whatever decision they make. Like everybody agreed to have been locked in the house for months on end. Um, so like the, what the state is doing often is not like got 51% support or any support or whatever. It's just kind of mm -hmm. been done. Um, and then the other thing that I want to mention, I forgot just now, um, was that like one of my increasing concerns is the fact that kind of heads of state particularly in the UK and um, elsewhere in the Europe. In fact, actually, the US has got this problem very bad at the moment, is that like all the heads of state seem to be reading from somebody else's script. Um, and that script seems to be written at the WEF, whether it's Schwab or all of them together or whatever. But like we like just recently, Boris Johnson has been tweeting a lot. And um, just every single tweet is build back better, um, leveling up, um, uh, acceleration, like all of these like um, WEF terms. And it's like, I mean, it's not just an isolated case like Boris Johnson's 
got in with the WF, like this is happening in the US with uh, Biden, and then like, you've got um, Canada, Trudeau, and, like um, Merkel. And they're all like saying the same things. And it's like, hold up a second, like who, who are you taking orders from? And like, where are you getting these these plans from? And so it's, it's, it's a lot more about like kind of just manufacturing consent and creating a narrative at home for somebody else's agenda rather than like kind of, okay, like this is this is our country and we're going to like make some decisions for this this place only. Um, so yeah, I mean, that I guess it's always been happening to some extent, but like recently it's been getting like super extreme. Uh, they can't say anything without like dropping in a build back better or a, um, uh, 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 um, leveling up now is being used every day in the UK. And, and, and these power structures are not new by any means, right? I mean, this is essentially, um, you can trace this back like, well, it's emergence in America anyway. You can trace it back to the Anglophiles like of the early 20th century, like Woodrow Wilson, who would say things like, you know, it, it's the administration and the intelligentsia and the bureaucrats job uh, and the politician's job to convince the people to believe what they ought to believe, right? Because there's like... It, 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 it all boils down to like this, this neoliberalism idea of there sort of being like the rulers and the ruled and, and the educated and the uneducated and like, well, we're the educated, we're the elite, we know what needs to happen. And it's sort of just uh, putting this, yourself on a pedestal and, and um, living with delusions of grandeur, um, but believing, you know, truly believe, like a lot of these people that, that get to the top of these positions of political power they're just sociopaths and they really do believe that like they're better and faster and smarter and stronger than everybody else um and that it's their job to like shape public opinion these types of ways of thinking you know, like you can trace them through like lots of esoteric ideologies um a lot of like what what people would traditionally look at and call like occultic ways of thinking uh and it's really not it's not it's sinister, but not in the sense that like there's these people at the top and cloaks in a dark room pulling all the strings and, and giggling about it. It's more so just like uh, it's a different way of thinking that involves like subjugating people for the purposes of subjugating them because they don't know any better. And, and it's my job to, to rule them. Um, I, I, yeah, th this is not any different than, than the types of things that the kings used to do with the church, right, to, to manipulate uh, the, the ways that the public thought, like to shape public opinion. Yeah, you could say that. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure to be honest with you, you know, um, it's, you know, it's, it is funny because if, if you talked about this, if you ever envisioned a situation like this like globally right now, and you talk to people like 20 years ago, even about, you know, the Bilderbergers, it was, it was still declared as a conspiracy theorist or, you know, if you talk about tri Trilateral Commission, Council of Foreign Relations, or, I mean, just read the book. Uh, I mean, it's, I know it's a deep rabbit hole, you know, the book of Carol Crickley, Tragedy and Hope, where he had access to archive documents and he wasn't supposed to publish that book. You know, it's, it's just it's so many, like so much stuff. It's it's out in the open, what, what I'm trying to say. It's it's nothing, there's no conspiracy theory behind it. You can you can read their agenda and it's so scary, you know, as, as Neil also somehow described it that all these politicians and puppets are just it's as if you know reading from the teleprompter you know it's just the same script you know it's really scary it's because or, or actually very funny you know when they're you know it's the same wording same phrases same uh you know uh, 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 sentences it's 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 mind-boggling. So, uh, who could have thought, you know, that we we have a situation like like this, and this is probably just the tip of the iceberg, uh, what we know about. And I'm also doing you know, this podcast. I'm like, uh, I'm I'm really concerned. You know, like what kind of world is is our daughter going to grow up? Uh, um, <laughs> is she gonna, you know, is she gonna be? Is she going to be free? Is she is she going to be what enslaved in a modern way or te technocratically uh, uh, way? Um, uh, like, how is this going to progress? And and what what are the solutions? And uh, are we fighting with 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 the accelerated you know uh, process of of these uh, control obsessive maniacs? You know, uh, 
uh, we, I think we really need to go back to, you know, as uh, we talked to Peter Young, you know, recently again in, in person about the free private cities. I said, you know, it's not about this, this project, free private cities. We, everybody, like all kinds of small communities need to get together and go back to the, to the roots, to localism, regionalization. I think Michael Krieger of Liberty Blitz something uh, newsletter. He also is a, a huge advocate proponent of, of, Going back to you know local economies, circular economies, and and uh, or when we when we listen to Alex Vetsky about the remnant, you know the, the the we don't need mass adoption. You know I'm to, now I'm totally convinced we don't need mass. We, all we need is like three, five, ten percent maximum of the population who are you know really who comprehend like who are the the real toxic Bitcoin maximalists and. And the rest will just follow as a sheeple. What, what is your, just, just for, you know, to wrap this up, what is your take on that? Like, where are we going uh, with this in five to 10 years? Solution oriented. Um, I see a lot of people talking about um, regulatory arbitrage and like going where people, where I get treated best. But as somebody who's moved around um, the world quite a bit, like, I don't think that's a particularly sustainable lifestyle. You need to kind of settle down at some point like if you're going to build a family like you need your kids to have friends you need like schools you need continuity um you also need to build like it's really really essential like for survival to make sure you have a good network um lots of friends ideally family um and it's very very difficult to to do that if you're kind of bouncing around and like as somebody who like considers themselves fairly nomadish to some extent um i completely gone off that idea maybe it's the mid-30s kicking in i don't know um but uh yeah I, I think people need to bear that in mind and then another thing to bear in mind is like if you are like planning on like okay i'll just wait for like somewhere adopts bitcoin and they'll look after me and i'll move there like if you're living in a foreign country and then they reverse their decision or they start going a little bit crazy um as a foreigner you have zero influence over um uh, what's going on there um so like uh, uh, like you're totally in the hands of the locals and how they decide to like push their country forward, their region forward, whatever. Um, and like now I'm currently back in the UK. I like, I think there's a lot of risks with living here increasingly, but at least um, I do feel like I have a little bit of influence over kind of local events. And um, it's easier for me to build um, a network. And then, uh, uh, um, yeah, I mean, like you can kind of, if there's any kind of really serious rules deployed, if you're a local and you speak the language and you can talk to people, you can often find loopholes and like work out the lay of the land, you know, how people are thinking. Um, like it's a lot easier to kind of navigate like treacherous waters, whereas that's much harder if you're in a country where you don't speak the, the local language. Um, but they're just obs observations. I'm not saying everybody should stay in their home country. Like things are getting bad, you should move out. But these are just like things that like perhaps people don't, um, naturally think about when they're like planning their um how to get through uh, any kind of troubled times um and like uh yeah in terms of solutions um i i mean like i, I think just a, a few things that people could do because it's very difficult to predict how things are going to play out but like making more connections like act, like proactively going out and building a network um because that, they're going to be really important if shit starts hitting the fan um and um, making sure that you do have options, like you've thought through some options for like getting to somewhere else, like, whether that's visas, passports, um, just even getting permission to leave the country. Like for a long while, the UK was asking permission. Uh, you had to ask permission to leave the UK. That's gone now, but um, could come back. Australia has had that for um, maybe a year, maybe longer. Um, and um, and then like, I mean, this sounds stupid, make more money. So like increase your income, um, and uh, um, buy some Bitcoin and hope hope that that uh, continues to pump because um, I think like if you're going to get out of bad situations like being wealthier is always going to um, help you get get through things and like aside from those that's all I can think of like I thought about this problem myself quite a lot and I know a lot of people I've read a lot of articles on this topic and like I haven't seen any kind of really like solid ideas for um, and this is the problem with government interventions. Like you don't know what they're going to do and it could be so extreme. Um, you just kind of like left waiting and guessing. I, I would echo a lot of that. I think uh, it kind of goes back to what I opened with 
when we first started the stream about Epehaic and um, how independence of mind and strength of character is rarely found among those who are not confident they can make their way by their own effort. And it's why I think, you know, Bitcoin, we, Bitcoiners, like those of us spearheading this, really need to be pushing this at the grassroots level and, and spending a little bit less time worrying about what the CEOs and the investment bankers are doing. Um, <clears throat> because we, we need the individual to be sovereign, right? What we need is to make government less relevant in people's lives. Um, and, and you do that by, you know, taking children out of state-funded schools. You do that by... Um, just making the state like less important in your life and less and more about like the people that you're surrounded by rather than spending all of your time and energy worried about what people in Washington, DC, who you've never met and don't ever interact with are doing it, your life and your fulfillment and your um, sustainability comes from the community that you live in, right? The people that you're surrounded by and, and what you do and how your decisions and abilities impact one another. And if we can do that, and if we can make the individual more self-sovereign through, you know, private property rights, which is what Bitcoin does so well, um, then, then people are less likely to gov give government all of this, um, uh, subconscious benefit of the doubt, uh, and just allow, whatever this unprecedented expansion of, of totalitarianism very sober very sobering <laughs> no um no, i really appreciate it, man i really uh, enjoyed our talk uh it was uh, lots of things to, lots of things to think about um you know for my listeners and you know especially in regards to our children this is something that that's more and more uh you know becoming a father or a parent a mother it's it's uh a total game changer it it the focus it, ch it changes everything <laughs> yeah. you know your your whole thinking process your perspectives your dreams your visions your everything you do you every decision you make uh short term long term so yeah it was it was a really amazing talk um guys where can people find you is there any other you know resources you want to direct my people uh, my listeners to uh, blog or twitter um, people can find me on Twitter at N Woodfine. Um, and I'm, I, I also work for Unchained Capital. So if anybody's having trouble with setting up their own multi sig solution, uh, Unchained Capital is a good place to go and, go and do that. Awesome. Heavily Armed Khan? Um, yeah, Twitter's probably the best place to find me at Heavily Armed C. Only follow me if you like seeing an idiot post his stream of consciousness on a regular basis. <laughs> what an understatement, Jesus. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you so much again, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, man. Thanks, Kevin. Have a great Sunday. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao.